Hello, everybody. I can see that you're all starting to join in. Thank you so much for being prompt. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm just going to read the comments coming through uh, from my phone. And let me know if you can hear me, see me, just to make sure everything is OK, because I am very, very excited about sharing this topic with you. So hello to Bettina. Hello to Lauren. Yes, please say hi to me. It makes the live much more live. <laughs> and it means it's an opportunity for me to connect with you, which I really, really love doing. Thank you, Lauren, for confirming and Bettina as well that you can see and hear me, which is fantastic. So if you can think of somebody that uh, could benefit from this Facebook Live, tag them. Um, if you'd like to share it somewhere in a group or on your timeline, that would be wonderful to help me to spread the word about animal communication. But not just animal communication, but what I want to talk to you about my own thoughts and observations and experience in animal communication. And as always, I want to remind you, you know, nothing I say is, you know, it is, is like what it is. It's for you to uh, decide whether it resonates with you and question everything. Because when I started animal communication and, you know, like a student we like to absorb everything and we take on board everything now not everything works for us so in time whoever you listen to and I'm just going to refer to myself right now because you're here listening to me is that anything I say you know question it does it mean something to you does it make sense is it something that um, gets you thinking okay so right we've got lots of people saying hello I'm Truly delighted that you are. So hi, Michelle. We have Michelle Morrow. We have Karen. Hey, Claire. Good to see you. And Piedad and Gite. Thank you very, very much. OK, I don't want to keep you waiting. You are here. And for those of you catching the replay, please just do replay. You don't have to do hashtag replay uh, because I always come back to check comments and anything you write in the comments helps me to get to know you. It's really, really important for me to get to know you because it means then my topics will be relevant to you, to your animal communication learning journey experiences. Otherwise, I'm just talking about topics that, I don't know, <laughs> might not mean anything to you. So the more I know you, the more I can tailor these lives and anything that I can help you with so that it really meets your needs. Hey, Louise. Okay, so I'm going to get on with it because ah, this topic is pretty juicy. Okay, so I'm going to share screen. And lots of interactions from you, please, because this really requires your feedback. This really requires me getting to know whether what I'm sharing with you is going to bring a lots of discussions between us. So I'm going to say a few more hellos. We've got Valerie joining and we have Bettina from Denmark. Brilliant. Okay. Right. So what I'm going to be covering in this session is my three-step framework for effective animal communication. The three steps are step one, intuitive receivership. Step two, interpretation style. Step three, systematic questioning. We're also gonna be covering about the only validation practice that I use to measure my skills and how effective I am as an animal communicator and why telepathy and intuition alone is not consistently bringing results. So I'd like to know in the comments, are you experiencing one of these or perhaps two or three of these? 
You often get information and messages from animals when you least expect or that you weren't actually asking direct questions. Do you experience that when you set the intention to communicate with animals, it doesn't seem to flow as well? You get mostly visuals and knowingness, but you're not clear what they mean, or it has no clear relevance sometimes to the question you have asked the animal. And also, are you experiencing where you receive information from animals, but when focusing on issues or questions that you would like to communicate with them, it seems to come to a halt? So pop in the comments, one, two, three. Which ones do you experience? If none, put in none. If a combination of the three, put those numbers down. It's really useful for me to know if any of these resonate with you. I'll give you a moment for the comments to come through so that I can see which ones relate to you and which ones you're experiencing. And also think uh, for, for some of you who might have been on the journey of animal communication for some years or, or quite some time, can you remember too whether one of these also resonated to you perhaps in the earlier days or something that just keeps occurring over and over again? Okay. Lauren, you're three. Deb, all three. Claire, all three. Bettina is one and three. So I love it when you share because it helps us to see that we're not alone. I do like to always bring this, <clears throat> you know, this point out is that when we are doing animal communication, it can feel very isolated sometimes. We sometimes wonder, is it only us? Do we only get this, you know, or do, do other people have it? So it's great that you're sharing. So Lisa loops, yours is a two. Carolyn, yours is a three. Valerie, all three, mostly one and two. Bettina, one and three. Okay, so I am pretty pleased with myself because it means that my own experiences, because this is where it's come from as well, my experiences plus observations, plus working with many, many pet parents and animal communicators, this is really where I'm getting the information from is that I'm observing and seeing that there's a, common thread and there's a pattern. So I really appreciate that you're also giving me feedback that you do resonate with one, two, three, or a combination of them, okay? So now let's go to, do you want to be experiencing where you have consistent communications when you call the animal in? So that when you're going to communicate with an animal, you just, know that the communication is going to happen. It's consistent. You want to understand the information you receive and how to apply it to the questions you asked. You want to effectively guide and support the animal to reveal what is causing the issue or struggle as described by their owner. Do these sound good to you? If, if, it, that, if it sounds good and this is what you want to be experiencing, put in the comments, good, because I want to know. Oh, yes, Lauren's written yes. So you can do yes with exclamation mark or you can write good. Is this what you want to be experiencing? Is this what you want to know? It's just going to happen so that it doesn't feel like it's hit and miss. Brilliant. Do you know what? I'm getting loads of goosebumps from your goods and your yes, because it feels so passionate. You're writing good and yes with such conviction, such passion. OK, so this is really important, isn't it, to all of us, because we want to enjoy communication with animals. Sometimes we don't understand why it becomes stressful. And that's really where I'm coming from. I want to just help you to really just release the fact that your animal communication, you know, genuinely does not have to be stressful. And there are reasons why it can feel or is stressful to us. Okay, lots of goods, lots of yes. We're really rocking. That's brilliant. 
So I'm going to talk about why you're experiencing this, as in why would there be information that comes through that we don't understand the relevance, or sometimes we didn't even ask for the information and it seems to be there. And then when we ask for it, it's not there. So what I've realized over the years is that telepathy and intuition alone does not bring consistent results. So here's a question that, I, again, I would really want to know from you. What was your entry point into animal communication? Was it psychic interests? Did you have an interest, for example, you know, you believed in clairvoyance and psychic work? Was it mediumship experience? Was it energy or healing work? Was it astrology and numerology? Was it past lives? What was your entry point? What was it that introduced you to animal communication? So aside from our own animals bringing us onto the path of animal communication, what was your journey before you came into animal communication? Does any of this relate? And obviously, if you have other, pop it in the comments. So this is the part that I'm going to be very interested in. So Claire is energy and healing work. Okay. Let's see what else is coming through as the comments take a bit of time to come through for me. And thank you so much for really taking part in this. Lauren is psychic work and healing work. Louise is energy and healing work. Deb is psychic interest, Reiki mediumship. Carolyn, I started with animal communication. Okay, Bettina, other, Theta, energy and healing, psychic and healing, astrology, psychic interests. Okay, and I'm very psychic, but generally in mediumship. I'm a director of Muddy Paws Crime, which helps stolen pet owners, and I feel could be beneficial. Energy healing work. Okay, there is a theme. So again, I'm pleased because. Um, I'm able to connect in where I've seen a pattern over the years of working with lots of animal communicators and pet parents and myself. My own entry point into animal communication was through oracle cards. But prior to that, I started to become interested in spiritual development, you know, self-help. Um, I felt that I could connect with energy. I was interested in kinesiology, I was interested in acupuncture, where there was a connection with meridian. So I had that. So it sounds like it's similar with most of you. Okay. So was it through this that you became aware of receiving intuitive, psychic, energetic information that was spontaneous? Does that make sense? So for example, if your entry point was Reiki, when you were learning Reiki and practicing Reiki and trying out Reiki, were you suddenly aware that you were receiving information without perhaps kind of consciously asking for it? Were you aware that somehow you opened your energetic channels and therefore information was coming to you? And when you shared it, the other person would go, gosh, yes, that really means something to me. So was that how you became yourself aware of receiving what I would call intuitive or psychic or energetic information that was spontaneous, i.e. you didn't have to ask for it. You didn't have to kind of be formal with it. Would that be fair to say? OK. And therefore, as a result of this, did it trigger your interest and then led you to exploring and studying animal communication? I would say that that would be yes. So what's happened is that I've become real. What I've come to realize is that animal communication has become synonymous with problem solving. So there we were, entry point, intuitive information, spontaneous. And then when we became more um, interested and invested more in learning animal communication. Would you agree that animal communication has a perhaps um, 
maybe a reputation, is that the right term? A reputation that it is something that a practice can, can bring about problem solving with animals. Would you agree with that? So if you agree with this, because I'm really interested in the feedback, do you also maybe either consciously or unconsciously know about this, that animal communication has become synonymous with problem solving? Write in the comments, problem solving or something like that. So I know that you agree with it or Claire saying, I agree. So, yeah. Okay, because this is leading somewhere. I just wanted to check whether you resonate with what I'm sharing with you so far. So Claire says yes, Valerie says yes, Deb says yes, because there we were maybe doing Oracle cards or doing Reiki, and then we realized we we're receiving intuitive information. And then we started to learn animal communication and we learned that we can ask the animal what's wrong, looking at behavioral issues, looking at you know things we don't understand about it. So we started to view animal communication is something that we can use to solve problems. Okay. So here's another question for you. Do you find that you are drawn to describing yourself to be an animal psychic or animal intuitive, or pet psychic, pet intuitive, that you're an animal or a pet healer, that you're an animal intuitive and communicator? or an animal healer and communicator, rather than animal communicator. Any of you feel as if, well, I don't know if I just wanna call myself an animal communicator. You know, I, I'm more of a healer or I'm an animal intuitive. Do you find it is as if you want to kind of not move away from the title animal communicator, but you feel as if you want to have something else that, I don't know, is, is it a, you know, like, and if I find animal intuitive seems to be a popular one, does that relate to you? Okay, so Lisa, I'm going to come back to you uh, with your question by uh, written comment because it's a big topic. Okay, big topic. Okay, so just for this Facebook Live purposes, it's very much about understanding the um, how to be effective in our animal communication right so Bettina you're saying I like animal intuitive better Valerie says I tend to use several descriptions Lauren says intuitive and communicator um, Deb says I use animal communicator but I want to add healer as well okay right again I'm pleased that I'm able to connect in with where you are all at. Brilliant. Okay, so I want to I want to share something with you that I think will help you to, because titles are very powerful on a subconscious level. So for those of you who want to or have a preference to say you're an animal intuitive or a pet psychic as opposed to animal communicator. Because of the belief that animal communication can solve problems, you could be saying, I want to pass on what the animal says, but I don't want the expectation to solve problems. Thumbs up if you resonate with this strongly. Is this something that when you were looking at studying animal communication and then you could call yourself an animal communicator, but you find that you want to use the word intuitive or you want to use the word healer, it's almost as if I feel like we want to soften it a bit. So thumbs up if you're into emojis in the comments that you could subconsciously be saying, I actually want to pass on what the animal says, but I get quite stressed when it comes to having expectations to solve problems. Does it influence the title you give yourself or influence the title that you would choose for yourself? Okay, so we have a few thumbs up, Valerie to some degree. So we have 
Yeah. Okay, again, thank you so much for sharing and being honest about where you're at, because this is exactly where I've been. And so I'm pleased that I'm able to share something with you that was going to help you kind of unravel what is actually going on that's not conscious. And when we are driven by an unconscious belief or an unconscious thought, our behavior follows that. So I'm a great believer that when you are therefore aware of what the unconscious thoughts are, you can then choose the behavior you actually want to, you know, have instead. Okay. So here's an excerpt from the book Animal Talk by Penelope Smith. This was the very first book I read with animal in animal communication. So Penelope Smith has written, I learned that not only do animals think, feel, understand and communicate, but also that the principles and methods used for alleviating human mental and emotional blocks and increasing harmony in living could bring incredible improvements to other species as well. My work as a human counselor and my own spiritual expansion continued. I remembered this paragraph so well because it resonated deeply within me, because this to me is where it came from, our concept and belief that with animal communication, we can help resolve problems. Can you see the connection? Can you see the link? This was, this is Penelope Smith's background. She was a human counselor. And when she realized that she could communicate with animals, she applied the same principles. Okay, so to me, this is where my understanding originated, that animal communication became synonymous with solving problems, issues, struggles. So let me share with you my three-step framework for the role of an animal communicator. Step one, we're looking at telepathy, the role of telepathy. Step two, we're looking at the role of being an interpreter. And step three, we're looking at the role of communication, talking to our animals and pets. So let's just kind of break it down. Step one, animal telepathy. This is my very simple definition. To me, it's the information that's imprinted in the energetic field of the animal. We all have that. Every person, every object has an energetic imprint. So when we use our intuitive senses, we actually enter the energetic field of the animal where we can perceive all thoughts and emotions, new thoughts and emotions, the current life, the historical life, their physical body and their internal organs. All that information is there because it's in the energetic imprint. So our intuitive senses, when we develop it, we can enter this energetic field and connect in with the information. Step two, translation. So this is where we translate the information that we are perceiving from the energetic field, where we can perceive precisely how the information shows up. So that would be, is it visual, is it sound, is it smell, taste, emotion, physical sensation, knowing. And the translation means we can relay that information with the help of our belief systems, our knowledge, our understanding, and our experience. So the translation is very much as per the animal communicator or the person who's translating what they're receiving or what they are getting from the information from the energetic imprint. And then we bring in 
within the translation, our own interpretation style. This is our background. Whether you're from behavior training, whether you're into massage, medical intuition, spirit guides, channeling, dowsing, essential oils, flower remedies, sound healing, acupuncture, nutrition. I was trying to think of everything. Chiropractic, Reiki, quantum biofeedback, homeopathy, healing touch, light therapy, meditation, astrology, numerology, Akashic records, oracle cards. If I haven't named something that you can share, please pop it in the comment. So can you see when we're translating the information, often we can seek out the energetic tools or knowledge that we've gained as part of how we interpret and relay the information from the animal. So this is why every single one of us has a unique style because it depends on our background, our knowledge, our interpretation style. Step three, so this is where the talking happens. Mind to mind and heart to heart conversations, interspecies connection. To me, this is where the communication and the counseling aspect comes into place because we can actually shift perspective. What does that mean? When we say we want to communicate with animals, when we want to listen to animals, what we mean is that we want their perspective. We want to hear how they experience it. We want to hear how they feel, what they think, what their views are, what their opinions are. So that's to me is why we want to listen to animals. And what this does is it allows us to have a holistic approach to recognize animals as spiritual beings, because they're not just physical beings. Now I want to bring in a quote from a book called Verbal Questioning Skills for Kinesiologists by Jane Thurnall Reed. She talks about systematic questioning versus intuition. And in this paragraph, she writes, many people rely predominantly or solely on intuition when they're asking questions. But this does not always work. Sometimes your intuition is just not working very well. This particularly tends to happen if you're tired or disturbed in your own life. It may also apply where you're working on emotional problems for a client that are similar to your own emotional issues. So I have a background in kinesiology and it's through kinesiology that I learned about the importance of how to ask questions in order to get the answers from the energetic imprint. The, can be an animal, can be a human, but the value of the right questions or effective questions was actually key. And this is the part whereby it really needs to be effective when we're looking at resolving issues or exploring problems, okay? So here is a couple of quotes that has been a game changer for me when I learned about effective communication. How would you feel if you knew that an answer that you receive is only as good as the question that's asked? So if you don't always receive the answer you expect, it's worth considering how effective your questions really are. Or to say it another way, you only get answers to the questions you ask. How many here are familiar with this um, concept of communication skill? Can I have a, the word communication? So I know that this could be something you are aware of, something that you're familiar with. Um, and if you're not, you can give me a thumbs down that you've not heard of this before and it's the first time. Let's see what your feedback is. 
So can write communication, if you've heard of this before, thumbs down, if this is not something you've ever heard of. So, okay. So this definitely applies in animal communication. So there you have it, you have an energetic imprint where the information is readily available, but when you're actually wanting specific answers or exploration for an issue, it very much depends on the talk or the communication aspect, okay? So Deb, this is the first time that you've heard this, however, it makes sense to you. So that's brilliant, okay? So let's study how the intuitive receivership, the interpretation style, and the systematic questioning must serve one another when discussing resolutions for an issue. I'm going to show you how if they don't work together, it actually falls apart. So here's the three-step framework. Step one, you have the telepathy, which is your intuitive, your psychic, your energetic senses. You have translation, which is your personal interpretation skills and style. And then you have talk, which is the communication and questioning ability. So let's look at how they can, how they work together. So when you have the telepathy and you have the translation, you will have access to the information imprinted in the energetic field of the animal. Now, this is where you can perceive the old thoughts, the emotions, the new thoughts, the emotions, the current life, the historical life, the physical body and internal organs of the animal. The information is readily available. You don't have to try. You receive it almost immediately. You regard this as what the animal chooses to tell you. Often we say that. We say, you know, the minute I entered into the communication, after I've asked for permission, information just came at me. So it feels very much that the animal has volunteered this information. It always feels very special because it's what they want to tell you. When you have animal telepathy and translation, but you don't have the talk, which is the communication and the questioning skill, the communication doesn't always flow. So after the initial hits of information, it can just halt abruptly. So you get visuals and knowingness, <clears throat> but you're not clear what they mean. It can sometimes have no relevance to the question that you've asked the animal. And then when you have the translation and the talk together, you will have information with the help of your belief, your knowledge, your understanding, your experience. Deeper information can be accessed by all the different practices that you know, your background, your own learning up to this point has given you. But when you have translation and talk, but you don't have the telepathy, then you will be questioning how involved the animal is when you're seeking their feelings, their thoughts, their views, and their opinions. It will feel as if you're just assessing the energy field. You're just you know, receiving the information without actually involving their feelings, their thoughts, their views. Yes, you can scan the energy field, but did the animal actually talk to you about it? Did they share about how they feel about it? So what about when you have the talk and you have the telepathy, you will have the mind-to-mind -mind and the heart-to-heart -heart conversations. You will have the interspecies communication. This is where the communication skills and the counseling approach, pulling in the old thoughts and emotions, the new thoughts and emotions, the current life and historical life. And you can really connect and talk about the physical body and internal organs of the animal because you can communicate and connect in with the energetic imprint. However, if you just have the talk, the communication skills and the telepathy, but you don't have the translation, you won't have the full experience of how the animal sends the information 
and also the spiritual meaning for their communication. So this is why intuitive receivership, interpretation style, and the systematic questioning must serve each other when discussing resolutions for an issue. So if you look at this three-step framework, it's likely that you may be strong with your telepathy. You may be strong with your translation, with your own interpretation skills and style, but perhaps you're not so developed or skilled with the way that you can ask the questions, or perhaps you haven't explored with, the, with regards to the effectiveness of communication skills. Maybe you hadn't even thought that that's what you need to bring into animal communication, particularly where there's going to be discussion around problems and issues. So can you start to see that unconsciously, you might be more drawn to calling yourself an animal intuitive because what you're saying is, I really trust my telepathic skills. I really feel passionate about my translation ability, but I'm not clear about my communication skills and effectiveness to bring into the session with the animal. Would you say that that could describe you. Now, again, like I say, they have to work together. You could be strong with your translation in your background of all your energetic tools that you use. Okay. And you may have very effective communication skills. But if you haven't developed your intuitive or psychic or energetic senses, again, it will kind of fall apart. Can you start to see how this three-step framework can help you to understand which area you need to develop? If that makes sense to you, if you resonate with that, could you write in a comment three-step? And in fact, if you can identify, is it telepathy? Is it translation? Is it talk? Which one do you feel if we had a three-legged stool, for example, which leg is the one that you need to strengthen or do a workout to strengthen that muscle? So Lauren is three steps, so you do. Okay, so which one? Is it telepathy? Is it translation? Is it talk? It can be, you know, it can be two out of three, it can be one out of three. It's fine if it's all three. Maybe they're all, you know, each leg's a little bit wobbly. That's fine too. So Louise, that makes sense to you. Okay, so for Lauren, it's translation. I'm just waiting for the comments to come through. In fact, I shall have a sip of water. Okay, so Deb and Valerie, Valerie's translation, Karen is talk, Tina is translation and sometimes talk, okay. So there's my three-step framework for the role of an animal communicator, so that you know that it encompasses telepathy, encompasses translation and talking, but working together. Right, so Claire says translation, sometimes talk, sometimes telepathy, okay. Any ahas coming through? Are you having, you know, some kind of, hopefully some kind of, you know, breakthrough in realizing that when you're saying, I, I don't like the pressure, of having to resolve problems, it's not actually that you can't, it's not that you're not able to facilitate that. You just need to have a more developed skill in having these three steps working together. Does that give you more confidence as well? If you have been finding yourself shying away from saying, 
I don't want to have any, you know, I don't want to have the pressure. I just want to pass on what the animal says. Now, that's absolutely fine too. I'm not saying you have to resolve problems. If your joy, right, it has to be joy. Love has to be joy and love. If your love is that you just love sharing information that comes through with no holes barred, no questioning, no kind of, you know, systematic questioning, then be yourself. That's your gift. But if you actually want to help to look at problems and struggles and why is the animal having a repeated behavior, then I would use this three-step framework. Okay. So Lisa, he says, do you feel some of this comes to us in dreams if they're very vivid? If it comes to you in dreams, you're looking at step one, telepathy. That's the muscle that you've, you know, worked. And that's the more developed aspect of the three step. So you want to, you know, be more, um, be more kind of aware of the translation aspect and also the communication in order to understand the information that comes through to you in dreams. But dreams is a really good introduction to you. If, it's, if you're new to animal communication, it's really just to say to you, when you're not in your analytical mind and you're in that place where you're about to fall you know, to sleep, that's when your channels are much more open to be receiving intuitive and energetic information okay so Valerie says this makes a lot of sense I like your breakdown of these areas of communication yeah so just to reiterate I'm not saying that you have to have all three if you would rather focus on telepathy if you enjoy the experience of translating but you're not really into the communication skills in order to resolve problems then please do what's right for you. But what I found for myself working with clients who do come to me with issues and struggles of, you know, things that are going on with their pets. And guess what? With my own pets, I have used this three-step framework, which I'm going to come to now, okay? This is the only validation practice that I use to measure my animal telepathic communication skills. It's no surprise to those of you who know me, practicing with your own pets is the best way to gain real and honest feedback for your animal communication learning. Let me tell you why. Step one, which is the telepathy. With our own pets, we can experience spontaneous exchanges of information. You can learn to send and receive in the moment you connect without need for words. Our pets are with us all the time. Therefore, it allows us to have more opportunities to experience spontaneous exchanges of information. This is so important, you know, that we are aware that this information can just come as and when, and we can do that for them. The translation aspect. When I say something to one of my pets, I can tell whether they, whether I actually, you know, whether they can interpret what I mean and I can interpret what they mean because just by whether they respond or they don't. So I can really practice my translation skills because I really learn how to inter interpret the communication from my animals. I can send them thoughts, feelings, and understanding in their language. It really helps me to kind of say, okay, I verbally said this, but what, what would that be like for them receiving it in their language? It really makes me become very conscious about how what I'm saying to them comes across to them. And when it comes to talking, the communication skills, the answer that I get is only as good as the question I've sent them. Absolutely. I have freedom to practice on my own pets because I can see whether it takes a day, whether it takes three days, whether it takes a week, whether it takes a month, whether my question 
made sense by the answer that they give me. I'm not under any pressure to have to ask the right question. They give me this freedom, I can say, to try it out on them. And I can tell by their response, by their behavior, by their shift, by the way they interact with me, whether my question made sense to them. So their answer is only as good as my question. So the three-step framework for working with our pets allows us to consistently have communications when we call our pets in. It means it helps us to understand the information that we receive. And it also allows us to effectively guide and support our own pets to reveal what is causing the issue. It's no doubt that we have pets who have issues. Everybody who has pets have issues, you know? So when we can work it out with our own, it really gives us the confidence and the ability to then transfer what we learn and what we know to somebody else's animals. Working with my own has really helped me to improve my communication skills with them, especially with the pets that don't answer back or take three days sometimes to answer back or I don't understand the answer. It's instead of me going, oh, you don't want to talk to me, do you? Which I used to do in the early days. I now say to myself, okay, the answer you gave me is a reflection of whether my question was any good or not. So if I'm not happy with the answer, if I'm not getting the answer that I'm looking for, I need to change the way that I'm asking it and asking it in the way that they can understand it. So just to go back, the three-step framework, you can work with the telepathy, the translation, and the talk, which allows you to have in tandem your intuitive, your psychic, your energetic senses with your personal interpretation skills and style, coupled by your communication and questioning ability. Okay, so Lauren says, love this, our pets validate our animal communication. Absolutely. When you have resolved or discussed or negotiate around an issue or a struggle you personally have with your own pet and you start to see the shifts happen, because either you've changed your translation, your style, you've developed your telepathy, or you've upped your communication and questioning ability, and you see the changes happening with your pet, tell me how can you ever doubt that it works, that animal communication is real, that you can do it. So my confidence absolutely comes from the times that my own animals and I have had to work through something. And now when I see changes happening, and also if I don't see changes happening, I'm still have the freedom to be more creative with them. So that allows me almost like a whole host of experience I wouldn't have got anywhere else to apply it to my clients. So let me tell you, therefore, if this is bringing up lots of questions for you and you're thinking, wow, OK, all this sounds really good, but I don't know how to develop my telepathy or I don't know how to develop my translation or I don't know how to improve my communication skills. I'm offering a step by step animal communication, one to one mentoring with myself. I'm only opening enrollment for the next four days, and this is for all pet parents animal communicators, animal lovers, we're all pet parents who want to learn because you'll be working with your own pets with a one-to-one -one with me. So you want to learn how to have trouble-free communications and get to hear what your pets are trying to communicate with you. So when you invest before the 1st of July, you will get my time-saving techniques and expert advice to become fluent in the language of your pets so the messages for you are not lost in translation. I'll be able to assess very quickly which part of the framework you need to develop and how to develop it. I'll help you to ask the right questions 
so that you have a surefire way to trust the answers are coming from your pet, that you are getting the answers that are as good as your questions, or your questions are gonna be as good as their answers. And the session will be recorded, okay? So that you have it <clears throat> to refer to. And if you wanna share it with your family, I think it's important to involve other members of your family just to show them how the communication is coming through and how you're experiencing it. So comment one-to-one -one if you would like me to send you further details. So I hope this topic has allowed us to discuss further amongst ourselves or just have an observation about where you're at with your animal communication you know, if you do struggle with an aspect of the animal communication, it doesn't always mean you can't do it. And sometimes we avoid that aspect. Okay, so I hope that I've brought something to you that you realize that you do want to help. You want to create, you know, a situation where you can release problems or issues or misunderstandings between people and their pets. But you used to, okay, now you know the three-step framework. You used to go, no, 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 I'm just going to pass on what the animal tells me, but, you know, I'm not here to solve problems. Now you know that the aspect of the solving problem is very much related to communication skills, the systematic questioning part. Okay, so thank you so much for joining me, and I'm going to get in touch with those of you who have written one-to-one. -one. So thank you for your time. Like I say, if this has been useful to you, give me a heart, give me a like, let me see it because I see on the phone it all comes up. It's really cool. And um, feel free to share this Facebook Live or tag somebody that you know. It's great to see some of you here who I haven't seen or been in touch with for a while. So all the best. Take care. I'll be in touch. Bye-bye now.